So I'll get started. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Brandon Liu. Um, I'm going to be talking about this topic, which is open street map and architecture and planning. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've been a mapping and OSM consultant for a few years. Um, and recently, since the beginning of this year, I've begun exploring this new space of OSM combined with architecture. So what exactly am I talking about when I talk about planning and architecture? Um, I'm talking about uh, companies, firms, individuals that are creating uh, things like building designs, thing, things like civic master plans. They're generally creating um, these things you wouldn't really call maps, but they have a lot of geographical information. Um, usually there's building designs on them, um, but there's also geographical context around them that's very important. For example, if you're designing a building, you also want to know what is around that area, so you also want to know um, in that neighborhood, is there a building that casts a shadow on your building, for example? Um, something I, like I really want to emphasize is this is uh, quite different than visualizing OSM in 3D. Um, because the final goal is to put your own designs on top of this data. Um, so it's not simply OSM. It's using OSM towards some other goal, which is your own renderings or maybe your own physical models. Um, it's also different than actually using this data for engineering purposes. Um, a lot of uh, the work I'm interested in is, is architectural work at the proposal stage. So you might not have a contract with a developer or the client yet. Um, so usually when you have some kind of contract with the client, they're obligated to give you the best geographical data available. But if you're, for example, a student or you're entering an architectural competition, you don't really have access to good data, especially in places uh, like China and India, where there's a lot of construction going on, um, but there's not really free access to geographical data from local governments. Um, so what I really want to emphasize is this idea of people in architecture and planning need to, uh, people in architecture and planning, they need to communicate visually through something. And this something almost always requires geographical context. Um, and I'm going to explore how OSM can contribute to that. Um, so an example of a professional rendering is something like this. Um, it's a building design, and it also has building context around of it. But that isn't very high fidelity. Um, those buildings are just kind of white blobs. It gives you an idea of what's in the area, but that's not, just, not necessarily the focus of this visualization. Um, so you don't need to know a lot of information about the surrounding features, but you also put on, you know, your own trees, uh, your own high-resolution building designs. Um, and there is, a, like, a huge industry around doing this kind of rendering work, um, and it's almost always a part of the proposal phase for architecture firms. Um, another kind of visualization that comes out of this is physical models. Um, so here is a building model created out of cardstock, and it also has some required geographical information um, at the ground level. So you have some road networks, you have some parks. Maybe if this was a waterfront property, you would have information about the waterfront or elevation. Um, here's another kind of model, which is laser-cut plastic, um, and this is a road network of Rome that will eventually, I think, be used for a physical model. So the big question that I had when I was seeing all these projects is where they get their data. And the kind of shocking part is that it's, it's kind of very hand wavy. Um, there is commercial data vendors. Um, for example, if you look at Google Maps, a lot of their maps come from Sanborn. Um, but if you want to buy like a really high quality model from Sanborn, like the quotes on this are like, 3D building shape file, like $38,000 or something. Um, and I mean, if you're developing like a really high budget project and you already have a contract, maybe that's like something you can swallow. But for most like, you know, smaller firms that are entering competitions or students, for example, you know, that's many orders of magnitude above the kind of budget they have. Um, so the incredible part is the kind of standard operating procedure is just to trace Google Maps. Um, and that's obviously like, like a licensing minefield. Um, but it happens a lot. Um, and I think 
there's this kind of weird disconnect in that people are so used to using Slippy Maps and having good data, but then when it comes to actually accessing the vector data, you know, people are doing things like opening this uh, screenshot in Illustrator and then tracing, turning that that Illustrator AI file into a CAD file and then putting that into a model. Like that is not unheard of at all. I mean, that's pr pretty standard. Um, and there's also um, the fact that a lot of this work is done remotely. You don't really have any ground knowledge of the site you're working on. Um, so you have to either use satellite imagery or something like Google Maps. Um, there's also a quite large community within uh, schools and companies. They have their own databases of CAD information uh, for cities that they work on often. For example, you know, if they do a lot of projects in New York City, they might have um, their own database inside the firm that has uh, really detailed CAD information. But there's also kind of these organizational issues where that's usually handled by the IT department. So, you know, if, um, if some drafts person wants to access that data, there's, you know, they have to jump through some hoops to get it. Um, right now there is an SVG export option from OSM. If you go to the main OSM.org and uh, you click the share button, you can take an area um, and export it as SVG. Um, so this works pretty well. Um, it's based on that minutely updated information. Um, but there's uh, two, major, uh, two, two major issues. One is that uh, each single way comes out as one SVG object. So it's not organized in any meaningful way. And uh, the second one is about the geographic projection, which is that it just comes out as Web Mercator. Um, and you don't really have any idea of scale. So if your building model is in meters and it's all um, proportional, then you can't really, uh, you have to do some futzing around with uh, this exported SVG file to get it to scale correctly in your building model. So, so as a whole, uh, just using, uh, uh, just using OpenStreetMap and Open Geodata and Architecture has a few technical hurdles. Um, one thing I haven't uh, gone over yet is file compatibility. Um, I think we all know about how kind of terrible it is to work with all this proprietary things like file geodatabases and um, you know like um, and ArcGIS and like the ArcGIS library software. Um, but I think it's a lot worse in CAD um, because, I mean, there's AutoCAD, which is kind of the market leader. There's also a software like SketchUp and DraftSight. They all have their own uh, pretty much proprietary file formats um, that are not compatible. There's nothing like really general like a shapefile. There is something called a, an AutoCAD DXF, which has a 300-page spec, which I've looked at a lot. Um, but it, even that itself, um, has multiple competing standards, and there's also third-party additions, which might or might not be supported in the software you're using. Um, right. So the file formats are one technical issue. The existing OSM export options aren't super great right now. And then I think you would also think that data quality would be an issue. But I think what I've, uh, I've slowly discovered is that uh, the data available from OSM is significantly better than what people generally have access to, um, both in terms of accuracy and completeness, um, especially in places, um, places like the developing world where there might be a lot of students working on projects um, in, um, in other countries. Um, I think OSM is the best data available. Um, but the other thing I want to emphasize is that there's a few technical obstacles, but most of them are really non-technical. They're kind of cultural issues. Um, I think the best way to put it is that there's kind of a huge gap between CAD and GIS. Um, there's not a lot of CAD users who have a lot of GIS literacy. And it's not, that, it's not really that they're not technical, it's that um, the idea of having to deal with things at a geographical scale is very foreign to them. You know, they, if you had to present uh, to them the idea to, uh, in order to choose a map projection, you know, even that is kind of um, a large step. Um, there are a lot of organizations, uh, usually the better funded ones, um, and schools that have a GIS support department, and usually they're very lucky to have that, but that's still an organizational boundary that they have to cross. 
Um, and that said, um, it's also very hard to kind of introduce them to the open source tool chain. It's not like you could find you know, a junior drafts person um, at one of these, ar these architecture firms and say, oh, just go install you know, this like, ogre to ogre thing and then you'll be able to pop out these files. You know, it's, it's not even like, it's not even at the point where we're even talking about software. It's still at the point where we're just talking about like, oh, um, what is the data and like, is the data even available? Um, there's also some other unique issues such as the cost of labor. Um, in architecture, it's not unheard of to have an unpaid intern. So if you're gonna have an intern trace things off of Google Maps, maybe that is actually costing less than hiring a programmer to go find some open data for you. Um, so overall, I wanna emphasize that this audience is huge and it's not that they're not technical, it's that they're, they're very well versed in CAD, they're very well versed you know, in meshes and um, things at the site scale but there's a very large disconnect between that and open geographical data. Um, so I kind of had this theory that there was this large gap and I really just wanted to give the people what they wanted, which is make the most frictionless way of getting this data to CAD users. Um, Cause they're all hungry for it. And like maybe I'm speculating like if they're able to see the benefit of OSM, they could eventually contribute. Um, so the, the most frictionless way for me to test this theory out was um, I launched a site called cadmapper.com. Uh, the very first version was just Metro Extracts. I just scraped the entire site of Metro Extracts and I converted them all to DXF files. Um, so in general, it's at the entire city scale. Um, it's projected into the nearest UTM zone. So if people are working in meters, then, the, then that UTM projected file is also in meters. Um, it's all uh, it's all distributed uh, it's all uh, distributed under the ODBL, so it just passes the license straight through. Um, in general, they're like five to two hundred megabytes um, because it's not very compact. It's an ASCII format, um, so you know, like even the biggest city, which I think was Paris, comes out to around two hundred megs. Um, what that looks like is kind of like um, this in Rhino, which is a pretty popular three D program, um, and uh, not only is the projection different than what you get from the OSM SVG export, um, it's also organized very neatly into road hierarchies, water areas, parks, and also railways. Um, so this was kind of my first foray into seeing if I could make this data very accessible to architecture firms. Um, a quick, uh, here's a quick look of zooming in on that data. Um, so this is just like any standard CAD file, you know, you can browse it and you can use this in your renderings. Um, and this took off really well. Um, in about, I think I launched it in August of last year and in the next six months or so, there was about 50,000 uniques visiting it, about 150,000 downloads total of files. Um, so usually people would come and then they'd come back for projects um, uh, continuously. Uh, but you gotta keep in mind that this is only um, the cities that were available as part of Metro Extracts. So that's about, at that time it was about 240 cities in total. So I also distributed as part of um, this website a survey because I wanted to know more about uh, this audience. Um, I determined that about 90, more than 90% of them used AutoCAD as their primary software. Um, and Roughly two thirds of them, they describe their primary industry as architecture. 25% um, in urban planning, and the other 10% in other. Um, there was some game developers, um, there were some product designers that wanted to build things, you know, like uh, doing 3D printing out of uh, these OSM models. Um, and I also, I also discovered here that about two thirds of my audience was students. Um, so a lot of them, you know, they just kind of are working on their, their senior thesis and they need some geographical information. And, you know, uh, so they just Googled, uh, I'm gonna need a CAD map of Paris and this was the first hit and it worked for them. Um, so th the next version of CAD mapper after I kind of took this survey was to build it so it was on demand. Um, 
and also, uh, and also to have extruded buildings because that's one of the th things people care most about is massing models. Um, so I wanted to take this height information uh, from OSM where it was available and extrude buildings out of those. Um, so the V2 of CAD mapper is completely on demand. Uh, so those metro extracts still exist, um, but in case the area you're interested in lies outside of those 200 cities, um, you have a nice UI kind of like this. You can choose an area. There's some options if you want to customize how the file comes out. Um, and within you know, a couple of seconds, it pops out a 3D file. You can download it and open it in pretty much any CAD software. SketchUp right now is the one I'm struggling with, but most of the major software suites, um, it should be compatible. Um, I'm going to take a quick aside and talk about the technical aspects of this implementation. Um, I built and open source some tools. Um, so one of them was something I call Planet to EBS, which makes it really easy to use a full Planet file on Amazon EC2. Um, it's a command line tool built with Bodo and Fabric, which just runs from your host machine. You can say, so I want to copy um, some, some OSM PBF file. Um, and it just with one command, it turns it into an EBS volume. With another command, it turns it into a running EC2 database with Postgres on it that you can render from. Um, another technical aspect um, is doing a, a, the mesh generation for the CAD files and, the, and also ray tracing it on the server side. So I can give people a nice preview of what their CAD file looks like on the, uh, directly on the website. Um, it also means that a lot of the corporate users who might not have a WebGL enabled um, browser can see kind of what the file looks like through this ray tracer because it just uh, pops out an image. Um, so this is an overview of um, all the areas where people have created CAD mapper files. Um, I mean, it's generally in the areas where OSM is, is the coverage is pretty good. Um, I've also done some investigation into just within a city, what areas are people interested in? And I think, um, that because people are using this data differently than just looking at a slippy map, I think this kind of information is useful for knowing which areas are, high, are pretty high priority in OSM. Um, something else that I've been looking at um, or I've had a lot of customer demands for um, is being compatible with laser cutters. So here's like a kind of coaster sized laser cut on what I did of Rome. Um, and there's a lot of actually subtle stuff in here. Like for example, um, the road intersections need to be clean so they can't have any lines in the intersection themselves. Um, so I've done some interesting stuff um, with Python and Shapely to clean up roads so that um, there is a line on either side of the road but not within the intersections. Um, so CAD Mapper overall, um, it is a registered service so I can send you emails and stuff. Um, right now, it's been running for about five months. Um, there's over 20,000 registered users. Um, there's about 50,000 files that have been created through this service. Um, and it's also financially self-sustaining at this point because um, for any file under one square kilometer is free. Um, and if you wanted to patch together one kilometer files, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. But if you want to do something more convenient, you can buy a larger file for about the price of a burrito. Um, I think on average, it's like, Nine or ten dollars is the average um, file price, um, but this goes i mean this helps a lot way both in paying for server costs and you know just paying for development on CAD mapper um, but I really wanted to strike the balance between sustaining CAD mapper financially and also making it really accessible to a lot of people, especially students oh um, there's also a student discount um, so next steps for CAD mapper. Um, the, so the most requested one is making it really easy to access terrain data. Um, I have this uh, kind of working. Um, I'm creating tins from SRTM with the new one arc second data set. Um, and I eventually want to be able to overlay OSM on top of this. So this is something I'm working on. If anyone has expertise in this, I'd really like to hear from you. Um, and the other thing that I really want to work on is how to get feedback from these users back into OSM because I'm, they're choosing a very explicit area and a lot of them are interested in the OSM data at a very different scale than your typical, you know, slippy map user. 
you know, the, so that might be much more discriminating about uh, how buildings are laid out or if there's data missing. So I'm going to be integrating an email feedback form because when I send you um, the file, it's through an email. So if you just reply to it, um, I'd like to use that as a way to feed data back into OSM. Um, in general, future work where I'm taking this, um, I think the three major questions are, first of all, how do we build OSM Mindshare in architecture? Um, because I think um, that just, uh, just looking at the institutions that are interested in OSM, you know, it's very, very well represented by tech, very well, very well represented by GIS. Um, but I think there's an entire class of institutions that can benefit a lot from OSM that just don't know about it yet. Um, and I guess the second question is, um, how can we let these become first class citizens? Maybe there's some way that, you know, we can do outreach to schools uh, to get students in architecture interested in OSM. Um, maybe there's a way to add, uh, maybe to improve the SVG export on the main OSM.org. And finally, um, the most interesting question to me is what unique data do they need and what unique data can they contribute? Because I imagine it has a lot more to do with buildings um, and parks and being able to, you know, analyze like sunlight, that kind of inf information compared to uh, like other use cases like routing and um, just general web map uh, topics. Um, that's about all I have to say. Uh, you can contact me just brandon at cadmapper.com or you can also find me on Twitter. Thank you. I'd like to take questions. Yes. Future AutoCAD of 3D model hyperscape file will be export into OpenStreetMap software. Is it that possible? Um, that's something I've looked into. The main issue right now is um, fragmentation in CAD because not everyone uses the same software. And like, I mean, um, I think the right way to do it was it would probably be to build some kind of plugin to CAD software that would know how to georeference data and bring it back into OSM. But that's something that um, I'd like I, I'd like to do some more research into. Yeah, but but I agree that's kind of the holy grail for this kind of work. Yes. Where do you get the high data from? Is that all data coming out of OpenStreetMap? Uh, sorry, can you say again? Is the height data data that comes out of OpenStreetMap? The question was, is the height data um, for these renderings and CAD files coming out of OSM? Right now it is. Um, I'd like to look into doing things like CityGML to see if I can overlay some of more detailed data where it's available. But right now it's all through OSM. Any more questions? Yes. Have you heard from any um, architects or planners who are contributing data back into the map once they use it? The question was, have I heard about architects or planners uh, that are contributing back to the map once they use it? Um, that's something um, I want to know more about but I don't have any way of, uh, of doing attribution right now. It's kind of, right now it's kind of they come on, they get their data, and they fly away. Um, but um, yeah, um, that to me is really the, the next step, which is getting feedback back from people who are actually using this. Yep. Sorry. Uh, one, one thing you can look into since uh, OpenStreetMap lets you uh, Let's be a login via OAuth. You could use OpenStreetMap as an OAuth provider. So if people have an account already, they could log into your site through that. So you could cross-check it. Right. Um, so that would be one approach is to build it into the authentication because I already have authentication on the site. Um, and I guess the other thing I'm really interested in is is adding um, is adding some kind of refer tag. So I because I have a bunch of links to OSM on my web page. So if they eventually go to the main OSM.org site and sign up, it'd be cool if, uh, if I could attribute that, um, that onboarding through somehow. Any last questions? 
All right. Thank you.